Hi, this is Gary Williams, once again, reaching out to friends and colleagues all over the world, really, who are sort of in the arts and in the creative industries to see how we're all coping with this crazy coronavirus situation and the fellow waiting patiently there, looking, I think, straight out of the shower. Your hair looks perfectly coiffed. <laughs> I've had a shower Ian today. <laughs> how are you doing, Ian? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. You know, I first came across you only a few months ago and you have become one of my all-time favourite photographers. I mean, of all time, of all the greats, because your book has made such an impact on me. It's called I Am Not a Wedding Photographer. I've got it here. I mean, this is, this is the first time I've ever sort of plugged anybody's product. This is not a, a, a <laughs> interview about plugging stuff, but I, this is just my favourite, favourite photography book. It's well, called, thank you. I am not a wedding photographer. Tell us what you're talking about. Um, oh, okay. Um, so I am, I would say that I'm a photographer um, who uh, ended up photographing weddings rather than somebody who wanted to be a wedding photographer or was running a wedding photography business. Now, um, I had tried on a few occasions to, I suppose, find my feet with photography. Um, and once I started to understand a little bit about um, photography history and become interested in photography itself, um, rather than it being a commercial endeavor, um, I, had the, I had the idea that what I would do is I would photograph weddings to make money so I could work on other projects. Um, um, it weddings not what you really wanted to do, but it was a way of paying for what you wanted to do. Right, right. And at the time, I don't really think that I knew what it is that I wanted to do at the time. Um, I just knew that I, I had a check, I still don't know now. Um, um, so, I mean, at the time it was a kind of, right, I need to make some money. Um, I've entered into this world of photography, or I had been a photographer of sorts for maybe about um, four or five years before this idea came around. I was shooting portraits in the studio. Right. Um, but again, that was a commercial endeavor. It wasn't something that uh, I, I didn't really understand the, uh, the creative process or the fact that it could be this expressive medium. Um, so shooting weddings was a way to make money to then explore more photography uh, as a documentary photographer, I think. Um, it became apparent quite quickly that uh, weddings could be a project in itself. If I approached it with, um, my understanding of what photography was rather than doing it in a way that uh, it's expected to be done and it so just grew got from an idea that. You, the, the way that you you know wanted the photography to be how different is that was that from the way that wedding photography is traditionally done right yeah i mean like wedding photography um i would say for the most part is commercial photography it's a business there are expectations from the industry there are expectations from the client um, a lot of wedding photographers, as creative as they are, um, still have to, I suppose, fit into, what, fit into what's expected. Um, so they have to get certain shots and the, 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 the photographs that they make are then advertising that they can create these, I suppose, fairy tale images. So people will see these fairy tale images and people who really buy into weddings will go, this guy can do that, then that's the guy that he can consistently do that, then that's the guy that I want. Um, and I just found that a little bit stale, somewhat boring, uh, contrived idea of um, how things should be. And I'm really interested in life itself and how things really are. And once I started to apply that understanding to an industry that's so entrenched in tradition and popular aesthetic, it, and that became a challenge and the project grew from that. And over eight years, I just pursued what I thought that I should be doing as far as for I, I don't know if this is, you'll allow me to do this or not, but just to give people an idea, can I, sh can I just put on the camera the first photo from the book? Is that all right? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is not your typical wedding photograph, <laughs> but I love this photograph so much. Amazing. It's so funny. But, you know, what's great about what you do is that you, it's, it's for real. You are taking a real record of the day. I'm sure you do. You probably spend, you know, 20 minutes doing the traditional group shot and some, you know, the bride, you know, cutting the cake and throwing the bouquet. But the bulk of what you do is just far more interesting, far more engaging, far more funny, because it's just real. It's real life, isn't it? It's a real wedding. 
Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I didn't really understand why people would want um, 50 to 100 photographs of <laughs> family members and guests just in different combinations. <laughs> I find that a little bit weird. I mean, it's not like I don't do a group shot or two. Yeah. Or do some bride and groom portraits, but like if somebody really wants that from a wedding, they're not going to book me to do it. And I find that the people who book me to shoot their wedding, they don't have this fairy tale, fairy tale idea of what a wedding should be. And the bride hasn't, from 12 years old, dreamed about the white dress and everything being perfect. It's more people getting together. Um, they're doing it because they want to rather than the notion that they have to. And probably the people that you end up working for are the kind of people that you prefer to hang out with anyway. Right, right, absolutely. Um, so just through the process of showing this work and it being getting a lot of pushback from the wedding industry, um, from people saying, well, it shouldn't really be done like that. And it's somebody's most important day of the life. It's a case of, well, they asked me to do this. <laughs> I'm not hoodwinking people into <laughs> trying to get them right. OK, well, I'm going to shoot your wedding, but ha ha ha, look what I did to it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was never a case of that and the communication is key with that so it was and, and as it will continue to be um, a, an ongoing project that focuses on weddings in our town mm. rather than trying to shoot every wedding exactly the same. So this is the first time in any of these interviews that I've done that we've spent any time talking about what somebody does but I did that A because I'm a big fan of yours and I'm interested but B right. Because as a photographer, you're now stuck indoors, so life has changed somewhat for you right now. Um, a little bit. Um, I do spend, I mean, most photographers uh, will spend uh, long periods of time um, without actually, I suppose, uh, working on anything uh, as far as the income is concerned. Um, as far as pressing the shutter, but I mean, that, there's, that's... We think of that as actually working, but of course, to get to the point where you're on the gig taking the photos, there's a yes. lot of work to do, right? Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, it hasn't been, I mean, we are uh, in the UK, what, 10 days into our um, restrictions. Mm. Um, I live like 10 to 15 minutes walk away from the city centre in Newcastle. So on my walk, I can go and walk around town. And over the last week and a half, maybe two weeks, uh, I've just been doing that as a means of exercise and trying to figure out what it is there is there or, or if there is um, any kind of project or anything that I can focus on. And that's now there, there are ideas starting to form already from that. You mean projects relating to the to the lockdown, to the current yes, yeah. situation we find ourselves in? Indeed. I mean, I am um, I fundamentally a documentary photographer. So and the commercial work that I do and weddings to some extent are only there to afford me the time to work on projects. Now, this situation has presented itself. I would be a little bit lazy if I wasn't trying to find something within that that I could then document as far as, um, like, I don't know, as maybe a project, a body of work surrounding this. And who knows what that will become? It's just something that I have to do. But of course, the challenge is the restrictions that we all find ourselves under now. You can't just go wandering around wherever you want, knocking on people's doors going into right. hospitals, taking pictures right. of what's really going on. Um, yeah. have you, have you, can you share your, uh, the, the, the germs of your ideas with us now? Um, it's somewhat, I mean, there are things about people in isolation um, that, um, who are totally isolated, that live on the estate that I do. Um, I have an interest in that. I'm just trying to figure out um, the safest way possible to um, approach that. Um, and obviously it's going to have to be approached in a way um, that is um, unknown because we live in these times that we don't really know what's going on. Uh, so that's a challenge within itself. Uh, there are businesses um, in town, uh, in the city, that have to stay open. Um, so it's a way of documenting that and why they have to stay open and the precautions that they're taking to be able to do that safely in this time. And just the emptiness of the streets as well. So, I mean, there are a few things and a few other things that may be connected to that, um, but I can't just sit and do nothing. As, I mean, as a, as a, basically, as a creative person, as an artist, are you finding it 
frustrating, this situation that you can't get out and do what you would just normally want to do? Or do you think there are opportunities here? There are certainly opportunities here. I find it, I'm enjoying the challenge of trying to figure that out. Uh, the frustrating thing for me is um, the beginning of 2020, it looked as though it was going to be a great year. Um, as far as commercial work, as far as some of the weddings that were already booked in. Um, and I mean that in a sense that that would have put me in good standing to then go and do whatever I wanted to do photography wise. Right. So it's the back end, the, the, the fact that I'm not now able to go to Benidorm at the end of the month to shoot the 10th anniversary of the Elvis Fiesta. That is the thing that gets me rather than the work or the paid work that I'm not doing. Well, that's right. Because, I mean, it's one thing is the money, which, of course, is, is very important. But at the same mm -hmm. time, you know that, I mean, you're in a position where you're able to pick and choose some of the gigs that you do now. And you're choosing some really fun gigs which you know you're going to have yeah. great opportunities and have a great time shooting right and it's disappointing yes, yeah. that it's not there anymore it that yeah it's incredibly disappointing i mean that's the frustrating part but we can use that i can use this time to then challenge myself to do something else um, and i think that anybody who is a creative i have friends who are designers photographers who work in the tv and film industry um who have pretty much been made like redundant overnight they're, they've got no work and they've sort of fallen off the radar and I, I can't do that i think we still need to be doing some, something we still need to be visible and we still need to be pushing through this and using this as you said as some sort of an opportunity to then create something else are you using the time at all to learn new skills develop skills uh, at all or is, is 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 that not something that you're interested in right now <laughs> well um or i do, did buy do you know everything that's my question do you know it all absolutely not i know nothing <laughs> that's the that's the way that we should approach everything i think um but uh, i bought myself a keyboard are so you gonna give us a now have, no 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 <laughs> so i i have um two guitars a harmonica a fiddle um, and now a keyboard, none of which I can play very well. I was so. going to say, are you one of these guys that just keeps sort of collecting instruments? And I'm a bit like that with books. I keep buying books, but right. one day I'll read them. <laughs> you have to, more, more books than you'll ever be able to read in a lifetime, kind of thing. I think John Peel said that about his record collection. But I mean, you've, but now's the time, isn't it? I was saying to somebody the other day, I mean, whether it's a book collection or having a keyboard or a, a mm -hmm. guitar or even a camera sitting around, we, you know, for years, all of us have been saying, ah, oh, I'd love, I just, what I really want to do is learn how to play the guitar, but I just haven't got, what I really want to do is learn how to use this camera, not right, in auto right. mode. I just don't have right, the time. Right. Now right. here we are with the time. But the problem is the getting the motivation, right? It is. Well, I think in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily time. It's whether it's a priority or not. And when we look at stuff like uh, musical instruments, um, or photography or any art form, the amount of time and effort that takes to be even to even become proficient is more than any most people are willing to give. What is um, it? But what is it ten thousand hours? Ten thousand hours, uh, apparently, in like as it um, in in the same vein, um, Cartier Bresson had said, "Your first ten thousand photographs are your worst." So it's this idea that we have to stick at it. I mean, I used to be. I'm a. I'm kind of a field musician. And before photography became um, a, the, the most prominent aspect of what I was doing with my life, um, I was kind of toying with, I was in a band, I was a singer in a band, not, not as good as you, obviously. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard you yet, I can't comment. I can, <laughs> I can maybe shout a little bit and play some chords <laughs> on a guitar. And that's as far as it went. I never really became anything more than that. And photography itself, when I decided to pursue photography then all of my obsession with music then transferred on the photography and its history and can you so imagine yourself ian ever moving on and having a if you like a third stage of your creative life can you imagine a time when photography becomes actually less important and you have another creative obsession um i think um whether it, photography would die out i don't know but during this time, uh, now that we have a little more time, uh, I have my own podcast. Um, out of is, focus. 
out of focus podcast. Um, and that is, it started off strong. And I think over the last year or so, I've just tried to keep it going because I didn't want to let it go because of all the work that had been put into it. It was sort of limping along a little bit. Um, but now this has given me time to refocus on that, um, having a few more ideas. And I might have a couple of people involved as far as um, expanding that, uh, growing the community and adding a few more things because I used to lecture on photography history. Uh, I've taught photography um, academically and, uh, and privately and I just haven't really had the time to keep that going, especially over the last year when it's been so busy. So this is now giving me time to hopefully add that to the out of focus umbrella. Have that under the out of focus I'm umbrella. As far as walking through your podcast, but I, I wanted to go from the beginning, from the first. But there's a right. lot of them, so I've started at the right. beginning and I'm going through. Um, I had to laugh because, like, I, you won't remember, but maybe three or four episodes in, you're like, "This is getting too long. I want it to be like 20 minutes, half an hour. Let's see what we can." Right. Do. And of course, that episode was also over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've found one. I I don't think there's an episode that's under an hour and I'm now, uh, I've just recorded, I, I've just been editing before we um, jumped onto this, uh, episode 55. Mm, mm. Um, and what I like about people that's interested in photography, it's, it's, uh, it, it's great because it's, it's informal chat kind of amongst photography pals, but I like the way that you give us a little uh, gentle introduction to some uh, uh, photographic history mm -hmm. uh, and then it's kind of a bit of a chit chat and general stuff and I think it's as a wide appeal to people that aren't just sort of photography nuts like right this. right well the the history side of things um drops off round about episode 30 something maybe there's only so um, much history there's only so much history and <laughs> I believe that the conversations that um we're having with photographers are as relevant um for now as introducing people to the history of photography so as you say there's only so much it's like kind of go around in circles it's like have a look at this photographer have a look at this photographer look at this photographer it all gets a little bit mm, okay we've done that and as with everything it has to evolve and it has to become something and um, better i think and more refined there are people um watching this that sort of enjoy dabbling around fiddling around with a camera like i do and want to use this as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about it, get it out of um, auto mode, start understanding mm -hmm. how to use it in manual mode and so on, what all those buttons do. Uh, can you suggest any resources for them or you know, any things that they might be able to do during the lockdown in their own home to develop their um, photography skills? Uh, make photographs is really um, the only advice um that i could give and i think we all we get into photography uh because um we want to make photographs um i think people start to make photographs in the same way that people do with music it's like i'm going to start learning to play the songs that i like so people start learning to make photographs that they like and trying to figure out how the photographers did that and that's a great way to get started try and emulate photographers that um, you're interested in try and make those kind of photographs with an understanding that you have to let that go and mm. turn it into your own thing. Mm. And if you, the more that you shoot, the more that you are going to um, come across ideas uh, of what it, what it is that you want to shoot. And the more that you study your own photographs, the more that you'll see in your own photographs that you have to pursue, rather than seeing something in somebody else's photograph that you want to pursue. Mm. So make photographs, be interested in photography. And for me personally, understanding at least some photography history will help you understand what photography is and your place within that. And the idea or the motivations of the photographer for me became more important than the photographs that they were making. Say that again. The motivations of the photographers themselves became more important than the photographs that they were making. So right. to understanding the why will help you to understand why you want to photograph. And again, only, I can only speak from my own experience that photogra the, the, the photographs themselves just became the form that follows the function of my study and practice rather than an actual goal itself. Mm. But we have to start somewhere. And the best way to do that is try to figure out the photographs that you like and try to make photographs like that.
Mm. Going back to the effects of this virus itself, you're in the Northeast. What, I mean, yes. are people doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are people taking it seriously now? And what's the situation with uh, just going to the shops? Are the sh shelves stocked or is that still a problem? Well, I think for the most part, uh, people are um, taking notice. Um, I have on my daily wanders, uh, mostly daily, um, every other day, if not, um, the streets are becoming quieter, um, the city centre is becoming uh, more quiet, and the shops themselves, there are queues, but not huge queues to get in. Uh, there's an element of social distancing, and everything's pretty well stocked, man. We're not, um, it, maybe two weeks ago, when everybody was going crazy for toilet rolls, which is odd, um, there was a little bit of panic buying, but everything seems to have calmed down a little bit now. And um, what I have noticed the, within the city centre um, is the, the homeless community is starting to uh, struggle a lot more. Uh, there, there are no people on the streets. They've got nowhere to go to use the toilet and get cleaned up and things like that. And it's becoming a bit of a struggle for them too. Um, but it's, they can't be on the street. The police are trying to move them on. Um, they've got nowhere to go. And it's a funny situation. Um, Hopefully, this isn't going to last too long. Mm -hmm. Have you any, um, of course, nobody knows, but what's your best guess as to when things may start to get back to normal? Um, well, I think we expect, I'm in a situation as my partner, Helen, she is um, head of people at Northumbria Police um, in HR. Um, so, you inside um, information, which you're going to share with us now. <laughs> A little bit. When um, is all this going to be over? <laughs> well, it's going to be. It's going to end on. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, best guess: a couple of months at least of um, this. Um, these these restrictions, and I mean, it's just the the issue that I have is Helen is now working from home, so she's doing fourteen hour days, and I'm um, sitting on the couch playing the. Keyboard. keyboard so she thinks i'm treating it like a holiday and she's working and she's in my space and i've got my office back for half an hour to do this which is nice so you're playing like you're on the couch playing chopsticks and saying this is my art you don't yeah. understand i'm a great artist <laughs> yeah 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 and she's like yeah you're treating this like a holiday well not this is what i do all the time really <laughs> yeah you just never yeah. see me <laughs> you just don't see me but i mean i don't know who can really know no nobody knows uh, things have changed so quickly um, nobody really knows what's going on, but I mean, looking at other countries um, who are starting to have a downturn in um, deaths and uh, reported cases, then it's going to be a couple of months at least. Yeah. Uh, um, but if just, people want to um, get in touch with you, find out more about your work and more about your podcast, what's the best way? Um, if they go to my website, which is um, ianweldon.com. Um, they can find me there. Um, there, is, there is a link to the podcast um, on there. If anybody wants to find me on Instagram, it's Ian J. Weldon. Um, I, you will be able to find all of the information you need through those things. And if anybody has any questions, um, do send me an email. You are very accessible. I love that about you. You're always there and ready to respond and talk to people. And thank you for talking to yeah. me today. It's really great to chat to you. Uh, and stay safe. And now you can get out of the office, let Helen do some proper work, and you can go and fart <laughs> around on your keyboard. Exactly. I can. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> All the best. See you later. Cheers. Bye-bye.